on the menu today. You never unload the dishwasher. Ow. Welcome. Here's an idea for a video. Who would like to see me on a hidden camera in Starbucks setting this up on the <laughs> desk? Hello, Chip Dippers. In a recent unboxing, I showed the generous donation to the channel by David Green of this Commodore SX64. I don't think you can handle this. Now I've always wanted one, as you can see. But also my philosophy with donations and unboxings like this is to use them to give something back to the donor and to the retro community that's hopefully of almost equal value. I really believe in keeping these beautiful historic machines in the public consciousness. So we're going to have some fun with this one. <laughs> We can't see what we're doing. But speaking of having fun with an SX64, first we just have to give a single finger salute back to these guys and check out these incredible lyrics. In a world of fun and fantasy and ever-changing views and computer terminology Commodore's news Are you keeping up with the Commodore? Cause the Commodore is keeping up with you Wasn't that great? In a world oh, of high technology and ever changing moves. In a world that's full of make belief and changing attitudes. Are you keeping up with the Commodore? Because the Commodore is keeping up with you. Are you keeping up with the Commodore? Because the Commodore is keeping up with you. Is it done? <laughs> wow. Classic. So here at Retro Recipes, we're always keeping up with the Commodore, but what is, or was, the SX64, also known as the Executive 64 or the VIP 64 in Europe? Well, as you saw there, a lot of business people were using it by the pool, as, as you do, and that was its target market as the world's first portable color computer thanks to that 5-inch composite monitor, not to mention a built-in 1541 floppy drive. As you can see here, it was set to have an upgraded version with two drives, but that model never came to be for reasons we'll get to in a second. And so instead of having a storage device, the space was just marked storage, a place to store your floopy disks and a sandwich. Now I can attest that this is one hefty, solidly built machine. It weighs 10 and a half kilograms or 23 pounds. Speaking of pounds or dollars, it launched in 1984 at a not unreasonable 995 bucks, equivalent to about $2,500 today. Not bad for a world first. Now nobody knows how many were sold, but there's not a lot out there today, so I'm going to guess it was in the four figure range, maybe 10,000. It also features this handy dandy handle, which Lady Fractic didn't think I could handle, but that really cleverly doubles as a stand to raise the screen more up to eye level. I'm really surprised it's a design that we haven't seen more of, settling instead for solutions well, like this. This is an almost fully compatible Commodore 64, albeit with the motherboard somewhat cut up into pieces inside, as we'll see when I start to refurbish R1. The main differences are the changed up basic color screen, said to improve readability on a small screen, and there's also no RF output or dataset port. Well, there is still a somewhat compatible cartridge port for games businessmen and women couldn't get on disc. We'll test that up too. But of course it still has an AV output. And then finally there's the separate keyboard, which I really think is ingenious in the way that it was built into that protective front panel. It's also really nice to type on. Even Ahoy! magazine favoured it over the Commodore 64s, calling this machine worth every penny. Speaking of pennies, the SX64 didn't sell well which is why we never saw the DX64 double disc variant or the SX100 monochrome version. When it was discontinued just two years after launch, it was blamed on a combination of poor business software availability, people ironically waiting to buy the DX64 that therefore never came, and poor marketing. Well, now we've heard that song, I'm sure we'd all beg to differ. 
So what about RSX64? It may look like it's in okay condition, but we've got a few key problem areas. There's this dirt that's actually behind the screen. There's this snapped front panel clip that looks like someone's tried to super glue it at some point during its life. And one of these handle end caps is missing. And then we've got some paint damage on various corners as well. So I really feel like it's my duty now to get this thing into museum quality, which is what it deserves. Clean it up, maybe 3D print some new parts and do a bit of future proofing as well. What do you mean, why don't we wash it in the stream like your bum? You washing your bum bum? You washing your bum bum? No, you can't put Commodores in there. Only in dishwashers. So let's start dismantling it and take a peek inside as well. how much stuff they've packed into this thing. At the back we've got our ports, power and I.O. chips, whilst on the side is the computer mainboard and processor. And this ribbon cable connects to the user port. There's even a user accessible fuse at the back. And behind that, taking up pretty much the whole other half of the unit, are the cathode ray tube and speaker assemblies. Now we'll start doing some repairs and future proofing in a moment, but when we first unboxed this, well not only did the shift key come off, which I was able to fix, but I noticed some other issues with the keyboard as well. So let's shift our attention to those. look at this thing it, well, it really has seen better days hasn't it and I immediately noticed this problem with the space bar how's it hanging well not very well on the left side and it's as simple as that ah easy keasy now luckily RSX64 came with its keyboard cable it's quite a mouthful but uh, they are super rare and if you've lost your one you have to improvise using a parallel cable or something else uh, this one does have this little bit of damage though, but this is going to be plugged in and never seen. So I'm just going to do a very basic cosmetic repair here using some black electrical tape. Harry, have you seen my toothbrush? No. Well, just a quick fix for now, but we need to save our time for some of the more complex repairs coming up. The keyboard itself though is pretty grubby. Ooh. So let's take it and that front panel over to the wish dosher so they can be cleaning themselves while we get on with those other repairs. Here goes the front panel and that handle of course was not looking very pretty either. So we'll throw that in as well, why not? And now everything's past inspection, I'm gonna throw in a standard dishwasher capsule. Contrary to what you might think, it's absolutely fine. It even contains anti-corrosives intended to protect your silverware that will actually protect the metal parts inside, including the keyboard springs. Just make sure you turn heat dry off so nothing melts. Welcome. leave that washing, let's do a quick bit of preventative maintenance. The storage tray above the floppy drive lifts up rather creepily like this. And that means we can get to the read write head and also the drive shafts. Wait, I thought mini disc was something else. Oh, anyway, and um, we'll power things up and here you can see the read write head moving up and down the disc along those shafts. So what we want to do is clean the head and grease the shafts. <clears throat> and it looks like it must have been cleaned recently because there's no dirt on there. 
and we'll also clean the drive shafts, these little metal spindles. But you know, the whole inside of this machine really is spotless. So I do wonder if somebody gave it a clean or if it's just been stored really well. So next up, we'll get our lithium grease. Oh, <laughs> that's thermal glue. Don't get those mixed up. We'll get our lithium grease and grease up those shafts. And not forgetting to lubricate the other shaft as well. And then we'll just run the disc to move the grease up and down the shafts. And that's it. Job done. But while we're here, let's take a quick look at some business software people might have used. Yep, you can even load Geos on the SX64. So this is now a full featured mouse driven laptop. Well, actually, it would probably crush your lap. No, tabletop. Well, I said mouse driven. I'm using the keyboard on this occasion. And no, I don't have two keyboards. And this was filmed just before I put the keyboard in the wish dosher. But look at the quality of that screen. It almost looks like an LCD. Now, because I can use C64 cartridges with this, I'd like to try this Commodore Diagnostics Titilis. Wait, oh, <laughs> Utilities cartridge. It's a cartridge without the shell, but that's okay. Pop it in there and run the tests. And our tuneful little machine passes with flying colors. Brilliant. What's also brilliant is if you wanted to create your own diagnostics and utilities cartridge, I recommend PCBWay. They do great PCBs starting from just five bucks. Cause as we all know, PCB stands for pronounced cartridge badly. Didn't I? And just because we can, let's try the Easy Flash. Careful how I pronounce that. This is the multifunction cartridge that gives you a choice of different kernels and you can boot other cartridge images from it. And I've loaded some other diagnostic stuff onto there and that all works perfectly too. Now, the next thing we need to figure out is all the dust behind this glass plate that sits in front of the real CRT screen. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be really tough to remove. Uh, let me try and loosen these two screws and see if we can get behind there. Now, I really don't want to take the whole machine apart, especially as it's in working order. You know, there's always the risk that we could break something or break ourselves. But I'm just going to loosen the bottom panel here to get to the two screws that are on the side of the CRT panel and see if that will loosen things up enough to clean it. And we've cracked this case. We are in. But we still can't get behind the actual glass plate very well. And it looks like we'd have to remove the whole CRT to do that properly. So this calls for a plan B. You see this brass clip? There's three of them and I'm just going to try and remove them. Uh, although if I do remove them, there's going to be no way to get them back in without taking the whole thing apart. So this is kind of a one way mission. Wish me luck. Jackpot. Just kidding, I'm fine. And finally, got this little bugger out. Now I'm trying every possible cleaning solution here, but this is just not budging, this strange kind of wavy thing. There's, there's also kind of an Atari logo burned in there somehow, perhaps from some kind of occult ritual. Now it's obvious this was a tinted glass, perhaps to reduce glare, or just to protect the CRT when the machine's being lugged from swimming pool meeting to swimming pool meeting. But having researched it online and asking in the forums, everybody agreed the glass isn't actually needed. And I've just realized how amazing the screen looks without it there at all. This thing looks brand new and even crisper than before. So for now, I'm gonna leave it out. And that also means we don't have to reinstate those annoying clips, but I'll safely store the bits I remove. But speaking of removing bits, that's what Tessa did with the Etikettendrucker 6240, removing several features, including the color screen, in favor of a cheaper, if not lighter, monochrome one for this German rebranded machine. Now you might have known that, but I bet you didn't know there was an SX500. It's a fully working portable Amiga 500. This just blows my mind. I mean, look at the Amiga keyboard. 
Now, Commodore only made three of these as prototypes, but when the Executive 64 flopped, this project was abandoned too. What I would give to own one and play with it here on the channel. But we've got our SX to play with, and in a second, we'll pop it out of the frying pan and into, no, oh, out of the dishwasher and onto the workbench. Puppy Fractured the second there has been guarding the dishwasher, which means it's time to unload it. Oh, steamed up my glasses. I am not exaggerating when I say this thing looks brand new. Now we must leave it to dry for a day or two, so there's no chance of any short circuits inside. But while hey. I- Hey, are you all right? You never unload the dishwasher. That is untrue. I unloaded it in- 2018. Yeah, when you washed your Commodore 64. Oh yeah. Yes, well, now that we've got a beautiful, clean new handle, what to do about that missing blue end cap? Well, as luck would have it, on Thingiverse, there are some 3D models for a few parts for the SX64. Now, I don't have any blue filaments, and I don't really want to paint the white filament that I have blue, because these end caps take all the brunt of any wear and tear. Uh, anytime you put the machine up on its side, these are the things that touch the surface, so that would easily get worn off. However, friend of the channel, Sean Harrington, does have some blue filament, so we don't need to feel blue. Let's pop over to his place and print out some new end caps. Here they are, Oops, sorry, here they are. Now they're not quite the right shade of blue, but I actually really like them. They are definitely darker than the original, but kind of feel like it's modernized it very slightly and given it a facelift. So for now, I'm gonna stick with these. I think they're a nice touch. Now I'm gonna put the new ones on both sides and keep the original as a spare in the museum. Well, plastic bag. Interesting side note, it does seem to match the keyboard blue better than it matches the main body blue, so we're just following Commodore's trends. Speaking of that lighter blue, I want to fix this front panel clip. It's definitely going to be a challenge. Uh, before I start to do that, I'm going to put the case back on, but before I do that, we should do a quick bit of future proofing. Now the main thing that worries me is these two chips, the PLA and the good old SID chip, don't have any heat sinks on them and they are the most prone to failure. So let's get sticky with it and put some self-adhesive heat sinks on there. That should buy us a few more years. And normally I'd do the VIC-2 video chip as well. But look at that, it's got a huge stonking heatsink on it already. Good job, Commodore. And when I have a bit more time, I'll come back in and replace these capacitors. Although they all look okay for now. Nothing too bulgy. Another quick thing I found really interesting was this crystal oscillator. Because this is one of the only things you don't find in a normal Commodore 64. It seems to be used to feed the 50 or 60 hertz timing to the CIA chips for the time of day. Now normally this timing is taken from the mains power's 50 or 60 hertz, which means perhaps Commodore had plans to make the SX battery powered, where it wouldn't have mains timing access at all. Yep, when I take this to Starbucks, we'll need to sit near a power outlet. Well, as I fall deeper in love with this machine, it's time to put its top back on, with a screwdriver set to gentle of course. 
and give it a damn good scrubbing. darling. I won't tell her if you don't. Now while she looks for that, let's turn our attention to that broken clip. Here's what I want to try and get it back to looking like. all well and good, but I really want to replace the clip. Now the other half of the clip for the keyboard is available on Thingiverse, but our half isn't. So join me as we make one ready for 3D printing. Next, we take the file out of Fusion 360 and load it into Ultimaker Cura. This helps us visualize where the item will be printed within our 3D printer's space. And also we can preview the actual layers and slices that the 3D printer will make. Now, because we've got this overhanging section here, the printer can't print things that are floating in midair. So it's gonna create these support struts here underneath that area. And we should just be able to pull those off. We won't even need to cut them. I'll show you that in a moment. Fingers crossed. Here it is. You can see that little support area at the bottom. Let's see if I can prise it off. And yep, comes off really easily. This is, I think, one of the most impressive things about 3D printing, that it can create parts that you can just separate like that. However, our model is a little bit too low down and a little shallow as well, just like it's dead. And also a bit too thick, just like it's dead. However, I think this proves the theory that we can make a clip that will work. So let's go back to Fusion 360 for a bit more fusioning. Oh, sorry, I was giving the goldfish a manicure. What? But 
the question now becomes, what color do we spray it? Well, this is the Pixel Wizard C64C case in SX64 colors. And I didn't realize that I put it next to the SX64 keyboard. What a great job they did. Now, Thomas Koch of Pixel Wizard said that he used RAL code 7022. And using this website, we can translate that into a Sherwin-Williams code that our local hardware store can mix up for us. Looks good to me. What do you think? I'm so happy with this. But I guess the important thing is, does it work? Yes, that, that was really solid. Case closed. All right, a couple more quick things before the big reveal. I noticed the back button was sticking up, so let's try and fix that. Ah, back is back. I also wanted to touch up some of the silver paint on the front panel. So I picked some of that up while I was at the hardware store. So let's get all touchy-feely and touch it up. Who's ready to look at the finished product? First, let's have a quick reminder of how things looked SX60 before. I'm going to the cafe to do some work. Bye, baby. Cafes are still closed because of the quarantine. Right. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it back together. Typical, really. You know, I wait 35 years to finally get a portable Commodore 64, and then I have to keep it at home. Yeah, could be worse. Well, thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the SX64. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to get some work done. But join us next time because we're going to be looking at the SX64 Mini. That's not an April Fool. It's really a thing. Until then, thanks for watching. Support below. Cheerio. <laughs> Cheerio.